functions. Yeah, functions first and graphs second. And I switch to lined uh, paper because hopefully I'll keep my font size more consistent. We won't always use F for functions, but we generally uh, use that letter F, G, and H for functions. Now, there's a triple equal sign that I use, which means is the same as. So y equals f of x. What that means is y is a function of x. So why do I use a triple equal sign? So a triple equal sign is necessary. So hopefully you've done enough algebra to know that these two equations tell you the same information. But what happens if I put an equal sign right there? What, is the, what additional information does this equation tell you? X equals 4. X equals 4. But what else does x equal? Six, so it equals four and six at the same time. So obviously, regular equal sign is not going to work right there. Um, you might know what I mean when I write it down originally, but if I leave it as a regular equal sign and it's all written in the same color pen or pencil, you won't understand later when you come back and read it. So we do that, so I know it's not just a regular equal sign right there. So either way, you look at the left, look at the right equation, they tell you x is 6. So it's pretty obvious either way. And if I scroll too quickly, uh, let me know. Uh, you can follow along. And it's probably a good time to check that right now, see if that works. Hopefully I'm logged into the Wi-Fi. Oh, come on. Most of what you need is going to be on your front page right here. And eventually. So we got the free calculus textbook right there. You can look at that. I also listed your pre calculus textbook right here if you want to go back and look at that. Uh, if you took the class before, you probably still have it. Uh, lectures, that's an empty playlist, but it will start filling up. What I want to show you is the notes right here. So this is this will work I, most any web browser. This should work in. A lot of times you're going to have to uh, zoom in, and there's different ways to do that. But this is the notes, and it updates relatively quickly, as you can see. Like I wrote that like within a minute or so. So it will have everything I wrote down write down inside these notes as well. If you miss something, so a good thing to do if you miss something, just leave some space in your notes, and you can come back and fill it in later if you don't have time. Like this stuff's not going to disappear. And this should work pretty well on your phone or tablet or whatever. So we got triple equal sign. So when you have a function of x, x is the input, also known as independent. variable and y is the output we call that the dependent variable
and all your x's, they live in the range, or live in the domain. And all the y's, they live in the range. And if we draw a, a diagram for this function, you have two sets. F tells you how to get from one set to the other. The set on the left is the domain of F. And the set on the right is the range of F. And F tells you if you take some number from the domain, where does it end up? It ends up at the number Y, which is take X and F it. So apply whatever function you have to X and you get your output Y function might be a trig function, might be a polynomial, rational function, lots of other functions out there. So we'll do a, a few domain computations. So there is really two, there's three domain rules, but only two that we need to worry about this quarter. What are the two domain rules that you need to remember? Can't zero. So can't divide by zero. That's one of the rules. So do not divide by zero. And what is the other rule? Yeah, don't take a square root of a negative. So we call this keeping it real. Because hopefully you remember, take square root of negative number, and you have imaginary or complex numbers. So we're going to keep it real in calculus class. So all the imaginary number uh, ideas that you learned, you're not going to need to apply them until you get to differential equations. That's the next time in math that you'll see imaginary numbers again. And maybe a little bit in linear algebra if you take that in the s fall. But other than that, you won't see imaginary numbers again until I don't know when. But in your math life, those are the only two places they'll come up again. So we're going to compute some domains. So when I have example problems, I write EX with the under, uh, underline, so that'll be example. And I write that for a few reasons. One of them is because example problems are similar to what I give you on a quiz or homework. So these are good to come back through. And uh, after you watch the lecture in class, maybe go back and cover up the solution and see, hey, can I actually solve this example without looking at the solution that was given in class? So we're going to find domain. of square root 4 minus x. So we're looking for bad x's. Is there any chance I could divide by 0 in this function? So that's out. No word is about dividing by 0. We just have to worry about square root of a negative. So we have to look at here is what I underlined is the input for the square root. So we could either look for the bad x's and throw them away, or we could look for the good x's and keep them. So it's up to you. I'm going to look for good x's. So what I did, I just took that inside part and said I want that to be 0 or more. So it's an equality. Subtract x. And we got x less than or equal to 4. Now I want you to answer on uh, an in interval notation. So there's 4. And x needs to be less than. I intentionally set up my inequality uh, that direction. You could absolutely have it like this. But then your less than number is on the wrong side. It's on the, the right side. 
which I like to go small on the left, big on the right, because my number line goes big on the right, small on the left. So I like the one in blue a little better, and that says it could equal four or anything less. And of course, negative infinity is the uh, end of that number line. So interval notation, we go negative infinity to positive 4. Whoa. What is wrong, wrong with what I wrote? Yeah, so our negative infinity is always open on the negative infinity side. So you don't want to include the uh, infinity or negative infinity in your intervals. Web work, when you answer your homework questions on web work, they're going to want interval notation for the most part. And you're going to answer an interval notation there. And we'll do, let's do one more. We'll get a little crazy with this example. So any chance of dividing by zero? There is division going on, or reciprocals. So it could be zero. So the, we could make this zero. Now you have to look a little more closely to actually say that it could be zero. But if you look x squared minus 1 plus n minus 1 will make it zero. So we can make that zero. There's also another thing we have to worry about. Uh, I cannot take a square root of a negative as well. So I have two things going on. So divide by zero, I'm going to intentionally, so I'm looking for the bad x's here. So I'm intentionally setting x squared minus 1 to equal 0. And I want to find out what x's are bad here. So I have two solutions, x equals 1 or negative 1. These are bad x's, so I'm not allowed to keep them. So these are the ones we're going to throw out. So these are bad. So that was divide by 0 part. Now I have to uh, worry about the uh, complex or make sure, making sure this is not complex. Now, if you look carefully, we have really there's two we didn't want x squared minus 1 to equal 0. And now we have an inequality where x squared minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. So we can actually combine these two together and just say x squared minus 1 just needs to be greater than 0. So we can combine these two together logically. So we just took those two and combined them into one inequality. So it needs to be not just greater than or equal to 0, but also not equal to 0. So that just means greater than 0. Now, a more tricky question, how do we solve inequalities of polynomials or quadratics? You have to go way back to pre-calculus 1. That was last year or earlier. We could complete the square. So we're going to answer this question. I'm going to create a new function, g of x. I'm not very creative on creating this function. It's just x squared minus 1. And I want to know when is this function uh, going to be greater than 0. So all we have to do is graph it.
and we're going to graph it by factoring. So x squared minus 1 is a conjugate. And a really fast review on conjugate. So conjugates factor out very nicely. a squared minus b squared. It's also called difference of squares. Factors a minus b times a plus b. Now that 1, you could write as 1 squared. So this is x squared minus 1 squared. What are my x-intercepts? So 1 and negative 1. x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. It's a happy parabola. So it's going to look like this. How do I know it's happy and not sad? It's got a negative in it. What does that minus 1 do to the graph? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a shift. Is it horizontal or vertical? It's going to be a vertical shift. So we got a regular x squared function, and we're going to shift it down one. So if we write the transformations, we're just going to shift down one. And we can see this with the y-intercept. So y-intercept, you're going to take 0 and plug it in for x. And we're going to get 0, comma. When we plug in 0, we get negative 1 for y. So there's our y-intercept. We'll graph this out quickly. So there's our three points we got. It is a parabola, so it's going to look like this. We're going to use a highlighter here. I'm going to use a green highlighter for the parts of the graph that I want. So any questions on the graph before I start highlighting? So what parts of the graph do I want? I'm just looking right, let's see, right here. So I want to know when is g of x not equal to 0 but above 0. So that is a y value. When's a y value greater than 0? So I want all this part up here. And I want all this part over here. What about the x-intercepts? Include those or skip those? So I want to skip my x-intercepts. So you could draw two circles like that. It looks like a fox to me. Doesn't matter. All right, so we're going to go from, uh, when we answer this, we're going to answer an x value. So our x values go from negative infinity to negative 1 and positive 1 to positive infinity. And we said don't include negative 1 and do not include positive 1. So there is our domain. Domains can be tricky when you have any uh, quadratic or higher degree polynomial. You have to graph it. If I had a cubic, we'd have to figure out x-intercepts and then it, if it looked Cubics can look like this or like that, depending on the end behavior. And there's a lot uh, of graphing that goes into inequalities from pre-calculus one. But that's just a really fast review. So intervals. So in set builder notation, there's the open interval. So x has to be a real number, and it's all real numbers that are greater than a and less than b. So between a and b. 
And that was open, this one is closed. So these are called square brackets. Sometimes to emphasize less than or equal to, you can write an actual equal sign under your less than or equal to. It means the same thing. But if you really want to make sure that people are going to see that it's less than or equal to, you can put a second equal sign underneath. So that's open and closed. You can have half open, half closed, or the other way around. I'm not going to fill in those two, but it should be obvious where the equal sign, equal sign is anytime there's a square bracket. And then not equal sign when there's a parentheses or a round bracket. So I did draw a graph already. I didn't define a graph. Graphs are sub sets of r times r, which is r squared. So if I write in set builder notation, it's all points x comma f of x such that x is in the domain of f. Another way to think about it, it's all points x comma f of x such that it makes sense to plug in x. That's all we mean by x is in the domain. So if it doesn't make sense to plug in that number into f, then you're, uh, it's not going to be on that graph. So that's the graph. And what is r2? It's a cool Star Wars character, but also R2 is the Cartesian plane. So it has x-axis and a y-axis. Each one is a real number line. So there's R2 right there. And what does subset mean? So the entire R2 is a plane. There is infinite points in both uh, axes. But functions, obviously, are not infinite points. There is the one function rule that says that right there is enough to not have a function. You have two points with the same x-coordinate. So subset means some of the points on here. So it could look something like that. As long as you pass the vertical line test, you have a function. function graphs pass the vertical line test and that means any x in the domain f of x has one value. It's not to say that the value has to be one but it has a value and doesn't have two values or three values. So we're going to graph using the clueless method. So what is the clueless method? It is the one where you make a table of values and plot points. It's a little less clueless because hopefully you've seen a lot of these functions before um, in calculus, uh, sometime in pre-calculus one class. We'll do the 1 over x function. So write down domain.
and from your domain you can build up your table I think negative 2 to 2 is probably far enough so figure out what your domain is fill in your table and then draw your graph I'll give you a minute to do this So what happens when x equals 0? Obviously, it's not in the domain, but what happens at the graph at x equals 0? I'm not plotting any points at, with an x-coordinate of 0. What does x equals 0 turn into on a graph? What is the graph of x equals 0? Type of line. Horizontal. Vertical line. So that's a vertical line, x equals zero. I'll use the fancy highlighter. I'll go pink. Oh, that's too small. Ooh. So there's my x equals 0 vertical asymptote. So we get connect from 1 to 2, but what happens when x is smaller than 1? The reciprocal, so if x is a half, the reciprocal is 2, third, it's 3, so it increases like that. Something similar happens with the negatives, except it decreases like that. And if you go past 2, if you go to 3, you get a third, 4, a fourth. It's going to get closer and closer to 0, to y equals 0. And this one gets closer and closer to y equals 0 also. So we have another horizontal asymptote. And this is the horizontal asymptote. So in rational functions, we looked at vertical asymptotes quite a bit. Anytime you divide by 0, you had a vertical asymptote. We looked at how do you know if you're approaching from the positive or negative side, crossing and bouncing, crossing and bouncing x-intercepts. And we're going to gloss over most of that stuff now and move on pretty quickly. <laughs>